Thank you, dear chairperson, for the kind introduction. And uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mansi Sabu, my dear friend, Dr. Rutul, Dr. Kanyendra, for inviting me uh, to speak on a topic uh, which is going to be uh, a daily practice for most of us, for all of us, I would say, in the in the next decade and beyond. So we are looking at using technology to integrate clinical care and diabetes in pregnancy. And why is that so important? Because there are a lot of need gaps that we find in our practice, which can be not just effectively solved using technology, but also it can be solved uh, with better economic means. So that's why using and integrating technology in the right way, with the right science behind it, it's also very important. So to start, I do not have a disclosure of any financial interest. And of course, if I uh, am talking about any product name or any proprietorship AI model, then of course this is intended solely for the purpose of illustration, does not imply any endorsement. And also, as I always do in most of my talks, that I always disclose that I have used artificial intelligence tools to summarize the content and prepare the presentations. I'll, I'll give some use cases of that as well. So we know that diabetes in pregnancy, both the pre-gestational and gestational diabetes, just not only affects the, the fetal health, but to a great extent, the maternal health. And a lot of that can actually be solved by using technological advancements, which are there readily available with us. So when you talk about the technology used in diabetes in pregnancy, you're looking at the use of CGM, the use of connected device, the use of some of the mHealth apps or the digital apps to strategize the treatment. And the whole focus here is personalized care and patient-driven care. So from hospital, to clinic setting care, we are going into that phase of patient centric care. And that's what I will be exploring in the next 12 to 15 minutes. So, there are a lot of innovative technologies which are available with us. As I mentioned about CGMS, that has become a cornerstone, and I will show you what the guidelines are telling us. Connected devices are, of course, evolving, and we need more research and science coming on behind it. Yeah. And digital apps is something which is already there. But we don't use it because we don't find it user friendly or we don't know how to use it and which one to use it for the right patient profile. So we try to demystify that a little bit using scientific evidences. And then we look at the evolving treatment paradigms like the use of artificial intelligence in the other modalities. So if you look at the continuous glucose monitoring system, the whole focus revolves around the use of real time CGMS, which provides continuous real time glucose level tracking, uh, which is very important to kind of monitor those peaks and troughs, those glycemic variabilities. What it does, it brings an improved glycemic control. Most importantly, it brings an improvement in the glycemic variability. As most of us would have noticed in our practice that most of your GDM patient or diabetes in pregnancy patient would have a more postprandial surge rather than have a increase in the fasting blood sugar. So this is this is one place where the use of CGMS does help you address those postprandial peaks, and not just that, it brings a huge behavioral change in the individual, especially when you're talking about the subset of GDF patients. Individuals have not been habituated to living with diabetes, but is going to live with diabetes for nine months only. And that's what I said, empowering self-management is very important, and it does a lot good in improving your clinical decision making. It takes away your inertia of up titrating or even down titrating the insulin because you're dealing with real point data. So what does the evidence tell us? This is the, from the latest standards of care uh, published by the ADA 2024. And I'll read this out. So it says that in people with diabetes on MDI or insulin pump, real time CGM devices should be used as close to daily as possible for maximum benefit. Intermittently scanned CGM devices should be scanned frequently at a minimum of once every eight hours to avoid gaps in the data. That's also very important. People with diabetes should have uninterrupted access to their supplies to minimize the gaps in CGM. For pregnancy specifically, it says that when used as an adjunct to preprandial and postprandial plus glucose monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring can definitely help to achieve the A1C targets in diabetes in pregnancy. So in a context like India, in our settings, of course, you cannot ask a patient to put on a real-time CGM for nine months, but you can start the individual on an intermittently scanned CGM, a flash uh, CGM, and help the patient understand the glucose profile, and thereby ask the patient to intermittently do SMBG and a real-time CGM, maybe, say, once in every six weeks or once in every two months to get that pattern and help the patient 
get a better understanding of the glucose profile. It doesn't look good. I'll give you some use cases of practice in my in my clinical practice as well. So concept, this was a trial which was done on type 1 diabetes patient. It was a randomized controlled trial. What it showed is that the value of the real-time CGM in pregnancy complicated by type 1 diabetes definitely showed improvement in A1C without any increase in hypoglycemia. That is very important because hypoglycemia becomes a major step limiting factor of type glucose control in diabetes in pregnancy. And also it did show improvement in the reduction of large gestational age births, the length of the stay as well as episodes of neonatal hypoglycemia. That is also a common complication we see at birth. The use of CGM reported mean glucose is superior to the use of estimated A1C, something which Dr. Piyush just mentioned that there are limiting factors of A1C, so we must use the CGM devices hand in hand with the A1C. Now, the decision whether to use a CGM in a pregnant individual with type 2 diabetes has to be individualized. In our country, we do often see more patients with type 2 diabetes going into pregnancy or we look at uh, more use cases of gestational diabetes. So that is where we have to have our own formed methodologies of using continuous glucose monitoring system effectively yet economically. That is very important because at the moment they're still costly devices and you can't ask the patient to just put on twice a month. It is not practically and economically feasible for most. So what are the targets you're looking at in Using continuous glucose monitoring, you're looking at the timing range to be more than 70%. That's the blood sugar has to be between 63 to 140. The time below range should be less than 5%. Uh, that is below 63, it should be less than 4%. And below 54, it should be less than 1%. And the time above range, which is more than 140, should be less than 25%. So this is for the type 1 diabetes going into pregnancy. The type 2 and the GDM, there are still no clear-cut timing range fixation because as it says here, that there are a lot of more research which is needed for us to understand, but by far that much, we can go with a minimum timing range of more than 70% in pregnancy. Let's look at some of the use cases in my clinic. Now you see what we're missing here. This is a 28 year old, uh, 28 weeks uh, primary gravida with the gestational diabetes on short acting pre-meal insulin. So see on the left, you're gonna see the SMBG values recorded on the connected app. And on the right, you see the CGM. So what have we been missing in this patient? monitored nocturnal hypoglycemia occurring at 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the night. Patient had literally no symptoms. Patient was doing SMBG. Patient was monitoring, but it did not keep, come up on the SMBG uh, data that the patient is entering, but it did get picked up in the CGM graph. So this connected device, now once you have a CGM, you have a place to monitor, you have an instrument to monitor, you need to get that connected. Why the connection is important? Because that will again create a seamless data interoperability. So once the data is there, the CGM values are coming into uh, here from the CGM device into a, into an app or into a system that has to be connected seamlessly with your app or with your electronic health record so that you can kind of enter and you can make changes to the patient's daily medical treatment as necessary that will also minimize visits to the follow-up. So it's very important for continuous monitoring and from the patient-centric side, it improves their adherence and understanding and most importantly, it reduces clinical visits because it enables you to give better remote monitoring and it enhances them to self-titrate their insulin doses. That is very important. Data-driven decision, that's what we're heading into, data-driven precision medicine. So that's where you will have all these interconnected apps and it's gonna be very easy. It's gonna be interconnected by API integrations. You can have your SMBGs interconnected with the app, you can have your CGM interconnected with the app, and all the data can flow in seamlessly, and thereby integration of those data will help you in reaching better clinical decisions. But do we have evidences of all these apps, or they're just being sold in the market? No, there are certain evidences, sorry for that. You can see here, there are various apps we're talking about, Control IQ, Guardian Connect, Dexcom, of course, is there, Gluco Mobile app, I've explored that. Uh, when well, I was in PTPD last year, then there is the Tandem T-Stimulator app, there are Milo's Coach, various such apps are there, which are, most, some of them are even FDA approved, and, and these apps go a long way in improving individual parameters. Now you can see some of, them, some of them has been categorized. Some is good for glucose monitoring, but the other is good for glucose tracking. Some is used in adjunct to an automated insulin delivery system, or insulin titration, some are very good nutritional apps. So you need to choose the right app for the right patient. That's what I said. Understanding this uh, health apps and then using it in the right use case is going to be very important for outcome.
So what are the usefulness of these connected apps? Look, look at this as a use case of my uh, patient uh, apps that I have used in my clinic. And if you go through the conversations, you can see here the patient diligently records the SMBGs on the left. Right? Yeah. Patient records the SMBG data on, on the left. You can see here, and the, there's also a chat box by which the patient can continuously be in touch with me in helping the individual titrating the team. The insulin dose. The second one shows a graphical representation of the SMBG values. If this also gives us a summary of the diagnosis, you get to see the medical record of the patient, what the patient is getting, and it helps you in kind of uh, connecting and bonding with the patient much better. So those those off hypos and the hyperglycemic surges that happens that actually determines the outcome of the pregnancy can be done away a lot if you can use simple technologies with interconnected apps with your patient. This is again a very recent patient of mine and just just see the conversations here again the patient is recording the smbg data they're, they're uploading it unfortunately this is not integrated directly with the C, with their glucometer but this is where the patient checks it and kind of enters the data parallelly the next best way is of course if you can have it directly integrated into your app that kind of makes it more user friendly for the patient but look at the conversations happening here this is where the patient is kind of skeptical about titrating or down titrating our dose and is connecting back to the doctor and we are giving them advices that you just do this for the next two days and get back to me. It's not possible to do it over a WhatsApp communication either because there are a lot of privacy issues and you get you get kind of perplexed with so much of WhatsApp text coming to you. So if you have an integrated app by which one patient's conversation will be limited to that patient and that it's going to be an encrypted conversation between the two and then you also have the medical history of the patient parallel to it. So you once when you are advising the patient on what dose to adjust, you also, you're also getting to see their previous medical records and the, the medication or the insulin doses that you had advised the patient in the last clinical visit. Now, let's come to the another uh, important technology point is using telemedicine. And that's again going to have a very important use case in diabetes in pregnancy because remote monitoring is going to be a key in achieving better glycemic control. So it will expand the access, especially to the remote areas, to patients coming from the rural population. If you can have these interconnected apps, and it's not costly, not costly at all. Uh, just you need internet connectivity, that's all. And that's there in most of our smartphones, even if you're in the rural region. Again, it can be used in monitoring the glucose level, personalizing the treatment, enhancing the virtual consultation. That's going to be very important. But there are some challenges that comes, and that's what we have to work on going into this digital era. Increasing digital literacy, and that is very important, not just for the patient, but also for the doctor. If the doctor is not literate enough to use the digital technology, then you cannot make the best possible use of these technologies. But again, we need more evidence, more real world evidence, and maybe more clinical trials also guiding us as to which connected device and telemedicine tool is best for our patient in real case scenario. Smartphone applications are there. They have wide accessibility. They provide real time monitoring. Besides that, in diabetes in pregnancy individuals, they're a good source of education. Again, I'm talking about a gestational diabetes patient who has no knowledge about what diabetes is all about, but they need to be educated in that nine months. You can have a constant education resources being sent using with these connected device. And what I was saying a little while back, there's a concept called match theory. And what it does is that if you can give the right information and education to the individual at the right point of time, then you're bringing a lot of important behavioral modifications in the individual. These are simple need gaps. I mean, we all practice we all preach in the in the conferences, but when it comes to practice, we are unable to implement that because of this need gaps. And this is the gap that technology will probably fill it in. And again, it will take us one step closer towards patient-centric patient precision care. So you got to empower your patient. But the most important point of these apps and technology devices is it has to be user friendly. And user friendly means the user interface, what the patient sees on the screen or what the doctor sees on the screen. Why most of us are using WhatsApp today? And not any other messenger is because WhatsApp has a good user interface. It's easy to use from, let's say, a 15 year old to a 75 year old person can use it seamlessly. Personalized tracking is going to be very important and instant feedback. This works great. Just some of the examples that I showed you improves the connectivity, not just with the doctor, but also with the other individuals in the in the healthcare ecosystem. The educator is gets connected. The nutritionist gets connected. So that that kind of improves the patient outcome. And it does makes the patient feel inclusive. That's very important. When the patient walks out of your clinic, the treatment starts from there. It doesn't end there. So it makes the patient feel inclusive and it empowers the patient to sort of stay connected with you, even, even when the patient is not, not uh, you know, in connect with you in real time. 
So some more uh, evidences, you can see some of these apps, like they have also shown that there's an improved compliance with blood glucose reporting. There is an improvement in the change in the mean blood glucose. There is an improved compliance in the feasibility and accessibility to the mobile decision support system. Again, these apps have shown, like you can see here, in bringing an improvement in uh, the incidences of cesarean section in improving the compliance and also in overall improving the mean blood glucose. Like one third of the studies demonstrated a reduction in the mean blood glucose level. And most important, it brings patient satisfaction, which was high across all these five studies, which has been analyzed in this particular paper. So education and engagement will be a key using these technological uh, you know, apps because that will help you in reaching out, provide right nutritional guidance and provide interactive learning. And it can even be reward based learning. You can give some kind of a reward to the patient for achieving a certain goal, and that again helps in improving the behavioral change of the patient. Besides these apps, telemedicine and CGMS, you have insulin pumps. Of course, it's not for everyone, but of course, for your type 1 patients, pump integration goes a long way. There is a good amount of data accuracy and consistency, and now the latest pumps will also help you in, in improving the hypoglycemic episodes and improving the quality of life. So this, this is the whole spectrum from personalized technology use to counseling on the device option to seamless integration with care plans and patient safety and autonomy is very important. But also data privacy will be very important when we have all these data coming into these integrated apps and there has to be continuous evaluation and adaptation. We need to make ourselves digital literate to know which apps and which technology to use for the right subset of patient. Again, this whole digital health ecosystem looks like this. You have patient assessment, continuous monitoring, the telehealth and the mHealth apps are on one side, intervention is being done by you in the clinic, and on the other hand, the data is coming in from your EHR and also using the various AI tools and the machine learning tools which are available. So what are the challenges? It's very easier said than done, but sitting today, with in the beginning of almost 2024, there are a lot of issues with the accessibility issues. Most important is internet connectivity. Low resource settings can be a limitation. Digital literacy is a problem. And healthcare system integration. See, this is a problem that we don't have enough data to integrate because the data is not entered. It's, it's in paper. It's not in the EHRs. So healthcare EHR system integration is more important to get us more accessibilities to the apps. Language and culture barriers can be a limitation, but again, that can be done away with. You can have the apps in the regional language. Like my prescription goes to the patient in regional language. Second last one. <laughs> so the future direction is going ahead with AI, wearable technologies and telehealth expansion will be there that will just be enhanced. And the integration of big data will be important and patient-centric app development will be more important for the future. So these are the four takeaways. The Important role of CGMS is very important. Emphasis should be placed more on patient-centric care. Focus should be given on overcoming these technology barriers, both for the patient as well as for the clinics. And we should be open to adapt and use artificial intelligence technologies in improving these technologies. We keep on doing a podcast every fortnight. This is happening tomorrow. If you're interested, you can just scan this QR and join us on the podcast. We keep discussing on multiple avenues of artificial intelligence and technologies in 